Boom. Boom. Here we are. All right. <laughs> All right. Welcome, welcome. So I am so excited to be here and do this um, interview. It's my first time ever doing something like this. Um, and um, I am very excited about it. I remember uh, meeting Jake at um, a men's night at the Kansas City Wellness Club. And I was doing 15 minute um, Reiki sessions. And um, they were usually when it's 15 minutes, it's like a relaxation, a grounding, um, very simple um, session. And Jake comes in and it was just out of this world. <laughs> and it was a very, very amazing session. And um, and then after time getting to know him and hearing his stories, I looked at him one time and said, I really want to interview you. And um, so here we are. Here we are. <laughs> and it's I, in full manifest. Yes, yes. So I'm so grateful um, to do this interview with you. I know you've been an inspiration for me, and I know that you're going to be an inspiration for everybody who joins today, as well as just your, your journey. So what an honor. I appreciate those thanks. words. Um, yeah, thanks for for providing this space. Um, it's an honor to be here with you. And, and as, as you mentioned, like we have been discussing this and it's like, this is, uh, this is when co-creating actually happens. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy to be here. And uh, if somebody gets some, some benefit out of this conversation then mission accomplished. Yeah. Mission accomplished. Which I love that too, because um, I know you're writing your book. That reminds me of your uh, humility. Uh, you're like, oh, as long as one person, when he wrote it, he said he's writing his book, he's like, if, if, well, as long as one person is benefited. And um, in the energy session, I'm like, oh no, this is going to be a big thing. You're here to do big work. And um, I, I appreciate how humble you are, but I know um, it's, uh, you're, you've, you've stepped into to these big shoes to do some big stuff. So it, it's something I'm working on. So, and that is to say, thank you. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I know that um, we to kind of start start things off, but um, a lot of times people get lost in life. They'll have their spirals, um, addictions, uh, depression, anxiety. There's things that people start to feel lost or disconnected. Um, and so tell me a little bit about let's start with there. Like, how did you, you know, know if you're lost, disconnected, um, connected? Um, you know, I, I, I guess for a long time, um, the loss would be the proper word because, uh, to be disconnected, you must be first connected. Um, and for a long time, I, uh, I was living in full ego. I was, uh, I was living in this idea that, uh, I present, this is the person I want you to think I am. Um, it wasn't my full authentic self, but at that point in time, it was the best I could do. Um, but uh, I had a lot of, uh, and, and we all do, a lot of demons. Um, and I had no real good solutions to handle them. Um, I was doing my best, but I was, I was so fearful for you to find out what I was really about and who I really was. And so I would present you... Um, who I wanted you to think I was. Um, and that was, that's changed throughout my life. Um, and, and so loss would be the right word to start out with. Um, you know, I, uh, I didn't truly find myself, uh, who I am today, which, uh, you know, um, I, I steal it from Tillyard Deschardins, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not a human being. I'm a spiritual being living a human life. And, um, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't come to understand that until I got sober. Um, because, um, you know, uh, I was living in full ego. And the thing is that that's okay. Most people do at some point in time, or some people do their whole lives. Um, some people live to 100. And they don't truly know who they are. Um, I've seen that within my own family structure. Um, so uh, the fact that I've found out who I am today and who I want to be today um, is truly um, a gift from God. And it's through God that I've found that. Um, what, and, did you, what did your life look like when you were lost? Um, it, you know, I was, uh, 
it was miserable to be honest with you. It was, uh, and I don't want to paint a picture where I wasn't a happy guy. Right. I had a lot of happy moments. Um, but, and it does get frustrating with, um, with how I was set up in terms of, and today I don't say, Hey, I just want to be happy. Right. Because happy isn't a state of being right. We're, uh, emotional creatures and we can experience the emotion of happiness right so what i've found out is that today i just want to be content because i have never experienced happiness without first being content so i want to daily i want to achieve contentment and that's my daily goal but to go back to your question is what what did it look like um you know uh a lot of it was a lot of fun um when i was younger i had a lot of fun um but I didn't realize what I was doing in terms of I was having fun because I was doing what I wanted to do. And if you didn't uh, jive with what I wanted to do, well, I would just go against you or I'd just disregard you or I would figure a way out to try to convince you to do what I wanted you to do or what I wanted to do. Um, so it was a lot of selfishness. I was living in a lot of self-will run riot. Um, uh, but, it, you know, that's OK when we're 14, 15, 16, because we don't know any better. We're, you know, um, but when you're 30, 31, 32, and you're just running around being a selfish person, we can create a lot of damage to um, a lot of people we care about. So um, it, it looked like different things, different times. But at the end of. Uh, I would say my. Uh, my alcoholism and my, um, my selfishness, uh, it felt like spinning plates. Like I just had plates spinning around and I, it was, it was very miserable because, um, it, you know, my life had become a lie and it was lies on top of lies because I, I was going to at all costs create this image that I wanted you to think this is who I am. And, um, you know, I had platforms to do that, um, being whether it be a character I created on the radio or uh, a character I created through my actions socially. You know, Jake, the party guy, he can out drink anybody. You know, he stays the last one up drinking. Um, you know, I was a lot of fun. I had a lot of good times um, and I still am. But the thing is that today I'm a lot of fun being who I truly am, not trying to be something I'm not. So in those moments when you were deep in your alcoholism and you were just having fun and partying and being the person that was really proud of drinking people under the table, do you feel like you're being authentic at that moment? Um, and it was more just when you went into work and, and like, oh, I'm not an alcoholic because I'm showing up for work. I'm responsible. I'm, I'm doing things like, do you feel even if that was a wounded place, do you feel you were free in those places or were you still wearing the mask then? Or was it just. So I'll say this like, so. I haven't always been an alcoholic, but the majority of my drinking was done alcoholically, mm -hmm. right? And what I mean by that, um, until I got to a place in my life, like, so I had a lot of alcoholic tendencies in my early and mid drinking. And then in my late drinking, I crossed over a threshold. And it's a jumping off point where once you get to that point, there's no going back. And that's when I, when I would describe myself as being an alcoholic. And what that means is once I started drinking for a solution, right? Whether that be, I don't like the way I feel, um, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do about this bill that I can't pay. I don't know what to do about these people who are mad at me. I don't know what to do about letting this family member down or, um, you know, I knew what to do because, I would find that drink and about three drinks in, I would feel that solution, right? And so it'd be like, I get a bill in the mail. And I wasn't able to pay that bill. What am I going to do? I'm going to pour a pint glass half filled with Jim Beam, chug it down, drink my Dr. Pepper. Oh, then I can breathe. And then I knew exactly what to do. And what that was is I'm going to rip that bill up and throw it in the <laughs> trash. That's my solution, right? But like the real solution was, I didn't like the way I felt, right? And alcohol changed the way I felt. 
And so that's, that was the solution. Instead of coming up with a real solution, because guess what? When I woke up the next day, that bill's torn up in the trash and I'm still going to have to pay it. But um, it was the only way I knew how to live. So it's like, I didn't have a drinking problem. I had a living problem. I didn't know how to live without alcohol. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's where I got to the point in time where it's like, and I don't I didn't even realize it when I was in it because I had excuses, right? Um, I had um, things I could say to you that would justify my drinking, whether it be, um, and, and there are things that have happened throughout my life that today, because my mind's still sick, I wake up with untreated alcoholism every day. So I have to treat it every day. Um, but there are things I look back that, a normal person doesn't have this thought. And what I mean by that is, um, yeah, I lost my mom at 27 in 2007, and I lost my father at 31 in 2011. And I would say within 24 hours of my father passing, this thought crossed my mind. And it's a, it's, and this is how I know alcoholism is a real illness, because this is not a thought of a rational minded person. This is a thought of a sick person. And the thought that went through my head was nobody for the rest of my life can say anything to me about my drinking. I can justify my drinking by saying to you, you know, as you know, my friends and the people that cared about me saw me at the bar close to blacked out again. And they said, Oh, there's Jake again. Oh God. Like, we should tell them to stop drinking. And so they, Hey Jake, maybe, maybe you shouldn't have that next drink. And I turned them in and say, you, you don't know what my life's like. You haven't lost both your parents. Like you don't know what it's like to be me. And it would shame people. And they, you know, and the thought, like, you know, that thought is hard for a lot of people. If you've lost a parent, you know, that thought. And if you just think about losing your parents, like a lot of people would be like, yeah, I guess I don't know what that would be like. And I don't know what I would do. And, and, but that was my thinking. And it was like, and it wasn't about me being sad. It was like a sense of freedom. Like I can drink without any repercussions. You got your free pass. It, 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 so to speak. Yeah. And then like, that's not a healthy, normal thought. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, if I, if I need you know, when, when I'm dealing with untreated alcoholism, if I ever get to a point and it doesn't happen very often, but you know, I'm six and a half years sober, there's still thoughts that go through my mind. It's like, well, maybe I could have a drink safely, you know? And it's like, no, you can't. Cause you have these kinds of thoughts and you have these kinds of experiences. And so, um, and so it's like, there's that point, that jumping off point where I drank for a solution and that's where I became an alcoholic, right? And it's an illness of the mind and it's an illness of the body. Um, and that's why they were tendencies, right? Because if I would have stopped drinking before I got to that threshold, like I would have just had a drinking problem and stopping drinking would have been the solution to my problem. And I would have been able, been able to solve that problem. So yeah, talking about, and I loved how you described that too, with the problem drinking and like with that threshold, but so for people out there, what, what does a problem drinker look like either from your own experience or just from your knowledge and education of, so people, you know, cause sometimes I, to me, I'm like, you know, a lot of people question, am I drinking too much? You know, I mean, alcohol sales went through the roof during uh, COVID the pandemic, you know, so I, you know, there's people do question it. So how do you know? Or, you know, sure. I, yeah. No, like, so a, a, a drinking problem can be solved. I suffer from alcoholism. It's a real deadly illness, right? And so what I mean by that is I suffer from a, a, a mental illness and a physical illness of alcohol. I'm allergic to alcohol. And what's an allergy? An allergy is an abnormal reaction to a substance. If you're allergic to strawberries, you eat a strawberry, you're going to have an abnormal reaction to that strawberry. Well, I'm allergic to alcohol. When I put alcohol in my body, there's an abnormal reaction that happens in my body. And what that does is I activate a craving within my body. My body does not break down alcohol like a normal person. And what that means is when I get to a third drink and a server comes and says, sir, would you like another drink? 
there's no real answer to that question. It's yes, right? It's not, a, but a normal person pauses, thinks about that and thinks, do I want that drink? Well, my body craves it. And so if I'm trying to, so I can never control and enjoy my drinking, right? When I was at the end of my drinking, I could control it, but I didn't enjoy it. Or I can enjoy it and I couldn't control it, right? And so a normal person thinks about, well, maybe I'm going to be hungover tomorrow. Maybe I'm not going to feel good. Or, or maybe, yeah, I want that fourth drink. But the thing is that they think about it, right? And it goes down the line, right? So when I took my first drink, there was no telling if I was going to have four drinks or 400. It was a question mark every time I took my first drink. And because I would want my fifth drink more than my fourth and my seventh more than my sixth and my 12th more than my 11th. And it's so down long until I either ran alcohol, I ran out of alcohol or blocked out. Those were at the end of my drinking. That's how my drinking ended. I either ran out of alcohol or I was passed out. Um, a problem drinker can have enough evidence sufficient to stop their drinking by their own willpower. Jake's willpower versus alcohol is broken. It does not work. And I'm a strong-willed person, right? I can assert my will at a lot of things and I can make movement on those things, right? And usually I accomplish those things, right? And so when I was 14 years old, 13 years old, I decided I want to get a division one soccer scholarship. And so I worked my butt off. I asserted my will at that and I accomplished it, right? And that's just one example. But when I asserted my will at alcohol, meaning my will, I'm not going to drink anymore, right? It would never be successful. I would never be successful on willpower alone. And so a person who is presented with an evidence, like you have a drinking problem, you, like an example for me, in 2008, um, I just lost my mom. And my mom was all over me on my health. And, you know, she would never call me an alcoholic, but she was married to an alcoholic. Her brother-in-law died at 43 of cirrhosis. Her father-in-law was an alcoholic. Her grandfather was an alcoholic. She knew what alcoholism looked like. She would never call me an alcoholic. But what she would say to me is, Jake, if you continue to drink the way you're drinking, you're going to be an alcoholic. And the crazy thing about alcohol, alcoholism is that I believe you can, yes, be born with it, but I also have seen and believe that you can drink yourself into alcoholism. You can become dependent upon the substance of alcohol so much that I've seen it with my own eyes that people will go through withdrawals so bad that they go into seizures. People die from DT and those are they're, they're basically seizures and people go through withdrawal of alcohol. That's a physical dependency that can kill you. So I believe you can be born with it. And I also believe that you can drink yourself into it. And so going back to your question, a problem drinker versus an alcoholic, right? And so if I was just a problem drinker in 2008, my father begged me to go get a physical because my mom wanted me to go get one for a long, long time. And I just refused because I was unhealthy. I was overweight. I was drinking a ton. Um, and so, you know, he gave me like the ultimate guilt trip, like, hey, if your mom always wanted you to do this, and if you, you never did it for her, will you at least do it for me? And it's like, man, okay, yes. And so I went through, you know, the blood work, the physical, and the doctor said to me, how much do you drink? You know, and I say, you know, not much more than everybody else, a couple a week, right? And I just said a couple a week and not he didn't know that I meant a couple bottles a week, you know, not a couple drinks, but, um, so he's like, well, your liver enzymes are off the chart. Like we need an MRI done on your liver stat. And so like within that week I went in and I had an MRI done on my liver. Um, and he's like, we need to go back to this drinking question because there is a real disease that causes cirrhosis in your liver that has nothing to do with alcohol. And you have pre cirrhosis in your liver you have developing spots and we need to identify what's going on with your liver. Here's a card for a liver specialist. You need to call him before you leave this hospital, right? That's a problem. Mm -hmm. A person with a drinking problem would stop drinking at that point in time. They would say, Oh God, like if I keep drinking, I'm going to die. Right. 
that's a problem. They can solve their problem when there's evidence. The evidence is you're sick. You need to stop drinking. Okay, I have a drinking problem. I stopped drinking, problem solved. I'm an alcoholic. What I did was look at that card, said, ah, I can't be that bad. And that card was in the garbage can before I walked out of that hospital. And I never called a liver specialist. I never saw that doctor again. Um, and that's, it's a miracle of God that I'm still here. And I, yeah. and I, and I, you know, and I found a solution to the way I was living down the line. Certainly not. I mean, I still did another six, six years of drinking uh, on top of that. And that's why it's like, that's why I have a profound appreciation for my body um, because my body refused to let my mind kill itself. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, that's why I take extraordinary care of my body today because this body does not belong to me. No. It's, um, it's a vehicle that kept my soul alive when my soul was asleep. My mind was trying to kill this body. My soul was sleeping and this body said, there's, there's a soul that lives within this body that I'm not going to let you kill soul like mind because my mind is sick. Yeah. Right. And that's the ego. That's, you know, that's my mind. When my mind's in charge, when Jake's mind is in charge, what my life looks like is I'm a 374 pound man living with type two diabetes, uh, full blown alcoholism, uh, depression, suicidal depression, uh, and a very angry person. When I do Jake's will, when I do what Jake wants to do, when my mind is in charge, uh, that's what my life looks like. Um, and so today my mind is not in charge. Yeah. It is not. It's, uh, it was for a long time, for 34 years, it was in the driver's seat. It was driving and it was driving recklessly. And my body was in the shotgun and going, dude, what are you doing to us? What are you doing to us? And my soul was sleeping in the back seat, right? Mm -hmm. And fortunately, my body kept my soul and my mind alive so that my soul could wake up, grab the mind out of the driver's seat, put it in the back seat and say, I'm taking over. So my soul's in charge today. My body's still riding shotgun and my mind's in the back seat. And look, my, and there's Ram Dass. Is, I have a lot of heroes and I'll say this now that Anything you hear on this interview that is outside of my personal experience, I stole from someone else. Mm -hmm. um, whether it be Ram Dass, whether it be Alan Watts, whether uh, it be David Goggins, Jocko Willick, um, I have heroes in life today that, that I, I, I take pieces from them and, and what resonates with me, I take it and I make it my own. But um, I, I'm in full blown get get better today. And I got to learn and, and, and create a healthy mind and healthy lifestyles where uh, back to my point being is that Ram Dass would always say that the, the mind is a lousy master, but it's a wonderful servant. Mm -hmm. Right. And so my mind serves me today. My mind is the one that gets me out of bed. My mind is the one that puts me through my daily activities but it's not ultimately making any decisions. It's just doing what I tell it to do. My mind is not in charge, um, but it is the most powerful thing that exists on this planet, right? Yeah. Because my soul doesn't exist on this planet. It, it's an entity that when I die and they do a, you know, mm -hmm. when they do an autopsy on me, they're not gonna find my soul, but they'll find my brain and they'll find all my body, um, but they won't find my soul. So my soul is super powerful. It's what's in charge today. But my brain is the most powerful entity that exists because everything that happens was first a thought. Well, I think that was one of the, um, when the times I realized I wanted to interview you because you hear people say, oh, kill the ego or get rid of, you know, kill the shadow or you're going to be free yourself from all these things. And, and if you don't, then something wrong. Yes. <laughs> that was a great grammar there. <laughs> There's something is wrong with you if you are still living from the ego or if you um, uh, do this. And I remember you saying that you're like, no, my ego's there. My mind's there, but they're my friends. They're coming along. Yeah. And I know when I do interviews, Energy work a lot of times it is like whether it's trauma or different parts of our personality can be scattered and to find wholeness and connection you have to bring those pieces together and so I love that that you said that you're like no I work as a team with the, the version of me that's an alcoholic I I, I 
I know he's there and he's always going to be there. And so I loved how you acknowledge that versus something that you eradicated. Cause if your mind thought you eradicated it, then it'd be a lot easier for you to fall back into those patterns because you're no longer an alcoholic. Right. And so that's what I mean by when I wake up every day, I wake up with an untreated alcoholic mind and I have to treat it. And I do that through prayers, intentions, meditation, physical activities, cold showers, breath work every day. I have non-negotiables that these things have to happen for me to have any success in my day. Now, am I going to have a successful day? I don't know, but I do know if I don't do these things, I'm not going to. Now, if I do these things, I have a chance at reaching that, what I talked about earlier, that contentment, right? I do these things. I at least have a chance of being happy because I reach contentment through doing these things. And so it's like, I'm a three-part entity. It's going back to what you're talking about. I'm a mind, I'm a body, I'm a soul, right? And I'm all three of those things. And I got to feed all three of those things every day. And to go back to what you're talking about is that, yeah, I had to create a new mind because the mind I was living with is sick. It's sick. And it's like, we all have, we all have, we're all sick on different levels. Um, It's like, but we live in a world where, um, you know, I have a lot of, I have a lot of skeletons in the closet, but like my closet's wide open today. Like, I don't like, I don't hide from any of it. I'll talk about any piece because I don't have any more shame for anything that I've done to this point, because every action that I've done good and bad, whatever relative term you want to put on it, If I'm content today, which I am, I'm a happy person right now in this moment, then all that crap had to happen. It all had to, that version of Jake had to exist. So this version can exist. I had to be 374 pounds. I had to have type two diabetes. I had to be a full blown alcoholic, right? It's like, I had to have that. I had to figure out what I didn't want so I could figure out what I wanted. And today it's like, we get caught up in, you know, I even do. And I say we, cause I mean me, like, mm-hmm. especially with social media, you know, I had to take a long break from it because, um, because I get caught up in comparing myself to other people. And it's like, and, and not in, in a, in a bad physical way, but it's like, look at all these awesome things this person's doing for charity. Why aren't I doing more? Or look at this, you know, this person who's running 50 miles in a weekend, like, why aren't I doing that? But it's like, I can't, I can't get caught up in that. And I'm human. So I'm going to on some level. So yeah, I did take a six week break from Instagram because I found myself having Instagram hold me accountable to who I am, right? Mm -hmm. I need to be accountable for who I am. And that means I only compare myself to one person. And that's who I was yesterday, right? That's the only comparison. It's the only accurate, fair comparison because nobody else is me. And so I compare, who was I yesterday? Who do I want to be today? And that's it. And today I wake up, I have a purpose. I state out loud every morning before I meditate. Um, And that's to God opened up my mind, opened up my heart, reaching and touched my soul, so I can be of maximum service to you, God, and to the men, women, and children I go about today, right? And I say that every day out loud, and then I don't go out and do that, right? Because um, if I just go out and I try to do that, it's not going to last very long, right? I have to go out and I have to try to be that, right? Because I'm a human being. I'm not a human doing. So when I go out and try to do things, it might work for a week or two, but eventually I'm not going to do it. Well, and that's sort of the comparison, the risk of that too, because they are like, Oh, you set that beautiful intention. And then you see somebody doing it bigger than you, then you'd be like, what's the, what's the point. Right. But if you're being it, then you're not, and you you see somebody else, you're like, Oh, that's cool. They're being it too. But, or you're not even really concerned because there's no comparison when you're being something versus doing it. It's just, I'm just being the best version that I can present today. And sometimes that's not very good. You know, my intention is to be 1% better than I was yesterday. Do I do that every day? Heck no. Right. But it's the effort towards that. Right. I wake up and I try to do that. And just in the trying, 
I'm successful. Right. And it's like, all I do is like, if I have a bad day, cause I'm human and I do, um, then I, I regroup and I got a brand new day to start with tomorrow. And, you know, and it's like, I have all these systems in place now today that, that, you know, that I'm tweaking everybody, just a little bit every day. Like the, just like I, I was telling you, we were talking before we sat down here and it's like, I don't believe in goals and I don't believe in motivation. Right. I believe in drive and systems. Um, and what, what I mean by that is give me an example. Right. So I have a messy garage right now. My garage is messy. And so I have a to-do list. And so on my to-do list, it doesn't say clean my garage. It says organize my garage. Um, because if I just clean my garage in about three months from now, my garage is going to be messy again. And I'm going to have to have a goal to clean my garage again. Now I need to put a system in place where my garage is organized. And so then everything in my garage is organized. It's just, you know, and then I keep it that way. I have a system set up and then I don't have to have a goal to clean my garage. And, it, and it, it's like that in a lot of aspects of my life. Like um, I used to like set goals for weight loss, right? And then you accomplish that goal. And what happens? We go right back to weight the way we used to do it. And look, I have had a, a, a lengthy weight journey and, but today I am a healthy person and, and I eat healthy it, and I do it. I try to do it every day. Am I successful? No, but I have a system in place where I try to, I don't just try to lose weight for a month. It's like, I want to be healthy every day. That's my system. I want to eat healthy um, it, because that's treating just if I'm just trying to lose weight, I'm just treating the symptoms. I'm not treating the actual problem back to the garage. Like my problem is I'm not organized. I need to solve that disorganization. I don't need to just clean my garage. I need to solve my disorganization. If I, you know, if I'm unhealthy, I need to get healthy. I don't need to just lose weight. I need to get healthy. Um, and that goes for mentally, spiritually, and, and physically. Yeah. Well, that's probably why, you know, that's you having a system of what you do, your non-negotiables is the system that keeps you sober Absolutely. and keeps you on the, this path. Absolutely. And switching gears a little bit, um, when we talk about like templating and family, family dynamics, um, like I always heard that growing up too. Oh, so-and-so was an alcoholic in your family. This was an alcoholic. You got to be careful, you know, if I, you know, and it was just like this stuff put on me. And I don't think it's just with alcohol, but a lot of times as, as parents, we um, really should be mindful about what we say to our kids. Oh, you're going to, you act like that. You're going to be like so-and-so, mm -hmm. or you don't do this, you know? And so it puts all this guilt and shame and this templating on, on us. And then it's really hard to have those expectations. So I know you mentioned your family has, you've had alcoholism in your family and how do you think that templating um, affected your life? And then not just your life, but in general, um, how do we take that templating and almost make it ours when it maybe isn't even ours to carry? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, you know, um, the alcoholism piece is a really easy one for me to look at um, because for a long time, like, I just, that's, I just didn't want to be that. I just, and so I, I, the truth was, I didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that I had my own definition of what an alcoholic was, right? And I was told that my, I saw it with my own eyes is a very scary thing when, when I went and said, you know, my father took me and my brothers to go, you know, basically say goodbye to my uncle who was dying of cirrhosis um, and I think I was maybe eight or nine years old and looking at him, you know, John, this is just, it was, I can vividly see it. it. And so in my mind, from the time I was eight years old, that's what an alcoholic looked like. Somebody who was dying on a couch, John, this with more red in their eyes than white. Right. And so it's like, as long as I wasn't that, then I wasn't going to be an alcoholic. And then I had other inaccurate definitions of it like which what i i never got to a point where i drank every day an alcohol is three every day right no that's not you know it's it, it goes back to an alcoholic is allergic to alcohol it's the craving that's created in their body and their mind is sick and it's like you know there's people that drink alcohol every day and they're not alcoholics um and so 
I told myself, I don't drink every day. I'm not an alcoholic. It's an inaccurate definition. Um, I, you know, for a while, it's like, if I didn't drink before noon, you know, uh, you know, I'm not an alcoholic until I did. And then it's like, I show up to work every day, right? I have a 401k. I have insurance. Alcoholics don't do that. Alcoholics live underneath a bridge with a, a shopping cart and a bag sack of, uh, you know, a mag dog 2020. Like that's, that's at the end of my drinking, that was the definition of an alcoholic. And it's not, um, the definition of an alcoholic is somebody who drinks for a solution. Right. Um, and that's what I, that's when I became an alcoholic, but, um, it's a very misunderstood illness in our society, because honestly, if you don't suffer from it, you don't understand it. Meaning, if you're an alcoholic, you know what it's like to not want to drink, yet not being able to have the power not to take a drink, right? For a normal person, they don't understand why an alcoholic just can't stop drinking. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't he just stop drinking? Um, you know, and I, I was that in that boat, right? When I looked at my father, I... Um, I didn't understand why can't he just stop drinking? And it crushed me. You know, um, my father died of, of renal cell carcinoma, which is kidney cancer. And he had a kidney removed, went through chemo. Um, cancer was gone for about eight months and then it came back. And so he had one kidney. Um, he was going through treatment. Did and, he still drink? And so, yeah. So I would go sit with him at KU Med Center. On a Monday morning, um, he would get his his bag of chemo, and we'd sit there and we'd have awesome conversations that I still cherish today. Um, I would sit with him during his chemo, and then I'd say, "Okay." And I was living with him at the time. Um, I was living at home with him, and it was just him and I. And so I'd be like, "All right, Dad, I gotta go do this. I know you got that stuff to take care of. I'll meet you back at home for dinner." Okay. See you later, son. See you later, Dad. Hug. And then I'd come back home that same night and he would be drunk and it would baffle me, be baffled. You just sat and had chemotherapy. You have one kidney and you're drunk. And it just made no sense to me. Today, I have full understanding of that. It was not a choice. He did not have a choice. His wife had just died three years before. He was dying and he didn't have a solution to his alcoholism. So he drank. That's what his solution was. And, you know, it's something that I got to understand firsthand because he would look at me the next day and he'd have a bunch of guilt, a bunch of shame, a bunch of remorse and say, I'm done. I'm never going to drink again. And I would just say, stop lying to me. Just stop lying to me. And he wasn't lying. Like what I understand today now is that if the FBI would have come in and hooked him up to a lie detector test, they would have said, he's telling you the truth. He is telling you the truth. He's passing this polygraph test. He's being honest, right? Because alcoholism is not a moral issue, right? And I found that out firsthand when, you know, I'd have family members saying, Jake, why are you drunk again? Why'd you do this again? And I'd say, look, I'm never going to drink again. And I would mean it with my entire heart and soul. Right. But I didn't understand that I suffered from a real illness where when you're at the end of that illness, a choice to drink isn't a choice. You have no choice. Right. I have a God sized hole in me and I have to fill it up with something. And I only found alcohol to fill it up with. And then I became whole. Right. And that's why I have to have a God solution today. Right. The only entity that I found that worked to fill that hole on planet earth is alcohol and booze, right? Once that was taken away from me, that hole's still there, right? And I had to fill it up with God. And so that's what I have to do every day because my power against alcohol is broke, right? So I have to find another power. And that's like, you know, your friends like, oh, congratulations on being six and a half years sober. I don't take credit for this. It's God, right? Now, I will say, yes, there are, there are actions involved, and I did take them, and, and sure, that is to be commended. 
because I am in a low percent of recovered alcoholics. Um, so I will take I will take credit for the action, but I will not take credit for being sober because I can't stay sober. I just can't. And I had to realize that, right? And, and until I got to that point, like it doesn't matter. And this is why I'll never call another person an alcoholic, right? Until they first call themselves one. Like I'll have friends come up to me and like, you really got to talk to my brother. He's an alcoholic. And I'll ask him, has he called himself an alcoholic? Does he know what an alcoholic is? He's like, no, but you should see how he drinks. And I said, well, it sounds like he has some tendencies or sounds like he has a drinking problem. Um, and at that point in time, until I decided that I'm an out, once I had the, the definition of what an alcoholic was, this, the real definition, um, and then I said, yeah, that's me. That's when I became an alcoholic. It didn't matter what led up to that or who said that. I can only decide that. And until I decide that, I don't have a problem, right? I'm just, you know, I, and I don't need a solution for how I'm living my life because I don't have a problem, hmm. right? And so if you don't have a problem, you don't need a solution. So, you know, people would try to present me with solutions. I don't have a problem. You know, but I would get enough trouble where I'd, you know, have to take action to get the heat off my back, you know, whether, you know, I've been arrested twice for a DUI. So I quit drinking. And, but until I quit drinking solely for me, I tried to quit drinking for a lot of people, for the, for, you know, the legal system, for, for everybody except me, because I really didn't want to quit. I loved it. Mm -hmm. And so until I got to a place where I had to quit for me and I have a problem at that point in time, I can start, I can start trying to create that new mind I was talking about. I can start trying to find a solution for living life without alcohol. Wow. So for somebody that has a loved one that's suffering and having the knowledge that in their midst, when they're in their shame and guilt and they are telling the, the hundred percent truth that they don't want to drink again, how either did people support you or how, how does somebody deal with that? Like if they, they know that you, you have the awareness and the compassion that they really mean this, but if they continue to do it, to drink or whatever the addiction and if it causes harm to them how do how do you think uh somebody sets boundaries or how does somebody best support mm. somebody man that's tough um it, it's not tough to answer but it's tough just to think about that because yeah. um the reality is that you can't do anything yeah you can't fix anybody you can't help them really um, what I will say is that you should, there's lots of avenues for help and you should present them with those avenues. Um, I'm a part of a fellowship. I'm a part of a 12 step program. And until I got into that 12 step program, I didn't know what the definition of what an alcoholic was until I started working those 12 steps. I didn't have a solution to life. Um, so, um, I would say how you present it to a loved one or a friend is you tell them you could be suffering from a deadly illness or you could just have a problem. You need to figure out if you are sick or if you have a problem. If you have a problem, then let's find a solution to your problem. If you are sick, let's get you medicine. Let's get you the proper treatment for your illness. And so that you present it to them, you're never going to make them do it. That's the reality of the illness I suffer from. Nobody was going to make me do it. And a lot of people tried. A lot of people tried hard. Um, Did the, you have people walk away or make decisions to leave your life because of your behaviors and inability or um, to change at that, at those stages? Yes and no. Um, I kind of did that on my own, to be honest with you. Um, I would ridicule people. I would, I would, I, in my blackout state, I was not a pleasant person. Um, so they, those people would remove them 
selves out of my life because of how I treated them. Um, and so yes and no, but, um, you know, ultimately I, I look at my life today and, um, and the, the biggest thing you can do for a loved one and, and whatever you believe in, um, whatever that is, um, outside of yourself, I call it God because I haven't found a shorter word for it. You, ha- you can only pray for them. You can only pray for them. Um, and way, the way I look at my life today is that prayer works. And what I mean by that is that today, being six and a half years sober, uh, trying to be a maximum service to God and others, uh, that's the answer to my mother's prayers. Because she would get to a point in time, you know, uh, <clears throat> I grew up before the cell phone era. Um, and there would be nights when I was 17, 18 years old, 19, um, and I wouldn't come home. She was Nancy Drew, and a lot of times she was able to find me. But there were nights where she, she couldn't, and she would call police stations, and she would call hospitals. Um, and then she just got to a point in time where she had no other option except to pray. And I'm the answer to those prayers today, the way I live and who I am. And so they worked, you know, her prayers for her son to be a happy, healthy, productive person. I like to think that God answered her prayers today. Mm-hmm. I love that. So yeah, I, I, I had people in my life that prayed for me and my grandma and um, yeah. And I know she, and I do this, I had to do this with, people in my life and and um my son at one point it's like you see somebody running towards the brick wall and they're going 90 miles an hour and when I tried to be like no you need to do it this way or that way or 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 control that it just he like that will was like no I got this (laughs) and so sitting back and just allowing and being there and supporting changed my relationship with him and it also my grandma saved my life that way by being the person that was there for me and supported me and prayed and um didn't try to control yeah i mean short-winded way to answer that question is um if they're a victim of uh an addiction or alcoholism and say hey you might have a problem or you might really be sick yeah and then outside of that you 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 have to i mean i had a lot of enablers in my life i had a lot of people who loved me and they thought they were doing the best thing for me um, but the truth was until, until I hit my rock bottom, until I was sick and tired of being sick and tired and until I was so tired of presenting a false pretense of who I am and what I'm about. And I got, would get caught up lies on lies. You know, when you're lying about a lie, um, it, it's a lot of work. Um, mm-hmm. and so it's like, Um, until I got to a point in time where it's like, uh, because ultimately I had to come, I had to face the reality is that if if I continue to live this way, I'm going to die. I mean, it's the, the, the gruesome reality. And it's such a powerful illness that some people are, are so deep in their illness that that sounds okay. It sounds okay. And the reality is that I was in that space. Like, you know, I talk about like, I don't talk about it often. I talk about it in the book and, and, and I have candid conversations with people who struggle um, with depression. Um, and I, I've been, I've been clinically depressed several times in my life um, where it's like the, just the incapacitating structure of depression of where I couldn't get out of bed for days at a time. Um, and then deep into my alcoholism where, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a gruesome picture to paint, but it would be, I would come out of a blackout in my bathtub with an empty bottle of Jim Bean on one side and my fully loaded nine millimeter on the other side. Um, the truth of the matter is I did not want to live anymore. I was just too big of a coward to pull the trigger. So I decided that I would just drink myself and eat myself to death. And um, it, 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 
that's that's where I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's it's the the message of um, it can always get better. I'm here to preach that. Um, and nobody's going to do it for you and you can't do it for anybody else. And that's, you know, the book Samurai of Soul. Hopefully it's going to be out by the end of the year. You, you got to see it over there. Um, Can we show them? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. Uh, this is the book. This is what it looks like. Right? So all those that wonder what a book looks like before it's in the book, you can have respect for the authors. This is, uh, this is, this is my book. <laughs> uh, these are all full and uh, two moleskin journals full. And uh, this is what the book looks like today. So, um, so it, it, it exists. It's alive. Um, I'm just working on finishing the manuscript to get it to my editor right now. But, um, you know. So I, in talking about the book, like, uh, not too long ago, you took a leave of absence from work, <laughs> yes. a leave of absence from everybody and took off. Um, uh, talk about that and like and why that was pivotal in being to the stage where your book is actually on paper. Um, yeah. And, and where I was starting to go with in the first mention of the book is, is look, um, we have to be our own heroes in the story. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's what that's what the book's about it's about you being your own hero because um like i i can't do it for you but i can say here look look what happened to me look what i did and now look where i'm at you can do that too and when i look around the world today it's like i started writing this book in 2017 um one for it was a very therapeutic process but it just never got any traction i never really like i went back so i went to buena vista colorado for 30 days um to really start hammering this book out and um and when i was going through my old writings it's like i'll be honest a lot of it got discarded a lot of a lot of i i, I kept some of the the bigger points of what i had written the three years prior to February. But the reality is that uh, a lot of it got scrapped too. Um, but the reason I started this book was for me. Um, I have a story to tell and I want everybody to hear my story. Um, and it never got any traction. And so as we're all aware of what happened in March of 2020, and as we got into what was going on with the virus and everything. Um, I started to look around um, and I started to see a lot of people who I considered educated, uh, well put together, um, way more responsible than me, you know, people with families and, and in my mind, right? We get that comparison that we were talking about earlier. In my mind, they were more successful people and they were coming up to me. And they were asking me, what do I do about this? Or what, what, what are you doing? Why, why do you have a smile on your face? Or why, why is this not affecting you? And, and it, was, it took me back. And I said, um, like, and that's when this book became God's book. This book is no longer my book, right? And so I wrote this book so I can put it out there. And the purpose of this book is, like I said, so somebody can be their own hero. And then what they can do is they can go out and they can help somebody else be their own hero. Because I look around this world and people need help, but we're not going to help them. We have to help them help themselves. So if we can be, um, whether that's through our actions and examples, or whether it's by actually helping them put together systems or, you know, support groups or whatever it takes. Um, you know, that's what this is about. This is about you helping yourself. And I'm here to tell you, I've dealt with a lot and, but it's no better or worse than what you've dealt with. We all have our sh stuff. <laughs> and just yeah. because this is my stuff, doesn't mean I've had it worse than you. It's just mine, right? Whether, you know, 
you know, people look at me like, wow, you lost both your parents by 31. Wow. You're a sober alcoholic. Wow. You've lost 170 pounds. And it's like, no, that's just my stuff. Like your stuff is your stuff. And it's just as, as traumatizing as my stuff. We all have traumas that we need to deal with. And it's like, but it's mine and yours is yours and it's no better or worse. And so it's like, once we understand that this, it's not a race of me against you, right? It's a race of me against me and that's it. And once you change one thing, your mindset, right? Once you change your mindset, everything can start, right? And if once, and that goes back to once I, you know, I'm all about self-talk, but I'm also about the truth, right? I can get into a place where I do toxic self-taught, but I also have to be realistic and I can't, you know, I like to surround myself with people telling me good things. And I, and I have, I have what's called my Debbie voice. That's my mom. Right. Mm -hmm. And so my mom, she'd be the only person that would tell me like, you're, you're screwing up. Like, you know, it, it wasn't that mommy's voice, like, oh, it's going to be okay. We all want that voice. Like, you know, it, we all want that. Hey, it's going to be okay. Our victim wants that justification. 100%, right? Yeah. And so we all want, I, want, I call that our mommy voice. We all want that mommy voice, right? And my mom just, she was not my mommy voice. She was my Debbie voice. And it'd be like, Jake, you're slacking. You can do better. Right. And so it's like, you know, when I was 250 pounds, you know, it's like, oh, you're not fat. You're just a little overweight. You know, it's like, that's what I would tell myself. That's what people around me would tell me. And my mom would be like, no, you're fat. <laughs> like you're unhealthy. Yeah. Like you're, you know, and, and like, that's what I need to hear. It's like, sometimes like, you know, I'm not a stupid person, but sometimes I need to be told you're doing some dumb stuff. That's dumb, man quit doing that but it's like like until we get real until we start telling ourselves the truth we can't start the journey can't begin so until you shift that mindset of what the truth is right and i'm not talking about you know crapping on yourself right mm -hmm. but if you're overweight you need to say i'm fat i need to do something about it or if you're not you know you're not working hard at your job you need to, i need to do better right? We need to expect more out of ourselves. And until we can shift our minds to do that, right? Our journey can't begin. And so the book is to help people realize that you can do anything your mind is set to. And also you can't do anything your mind is set to. And I hear that all the time. It's like, you know, oh, I can never do that. And it's like, you're right. If you say you never can do that, you're never going to do it. Yeah, because our mind does what we tell it to 100%, do. Yeah, hundred percent. But it's like, so it's, we got to we got to really be cognizant of what we tell ourselves on the internal dialogue. And I catch people doing it out loud. Like it just becomes a habit. Like you know, oh, I could never do that. And it's like, yeah, you can. You definitely can. But if you say you can't, you're not gonna. Mm -hmm. And so it's like we need to understand. Like it's back to until we have a problem, then we can start finding a solution for it. And so it's like, um, it's like the, the time up on the mountain, um, it was, you know, whew, it, it's hard to put into words. Um, there was a, a lot of internal struggle. I mean, I had to, I had to go back into these traumas and pull them back out and relive them all. And, you know, there were, there were nights of just a lot of tears and a lot of, and, you know, a lot of processing again, I was, I thought I was done with this stuff. I mean, I've done a lot of work and, and I fully believe, um, you know, I talked about um, keeping the mind, the body and the spirit all healthy. You know, I, I see a regular therapist and I see you. Um, I, you know, I exercise, I eat healthy. Like, these are all things. These are the systems that I talk about. Like, like there's nothing wrong with getting therapy. There's nothing wrong with doing energy work. There's nothing wrong with getting help. It's actually, you know, asking for help is a very, 
uh, it's a big thing. It's an empowering thing. Uh, you can get a lot of power from asking for help. Um, it's just nothing to be ashamed of. Um, but we create these, these little roadblocks in our mind that we call them, we want to call them, you know, weaknesses, or we, we just have these preconceived notions that were planted in our head one way or another that we have to just rip down and start from scratch. And, you know, I, I, that's why my life has to be transparent. Like I'll talk about anything that I've done. I don't hide anything. I can't, I got no room for it. Right. I, I just, I can't run away from any of my indiscretions in my past and they're all in the book. And it's, I mean, it, it's even like, you know, reading the description that you wrote, it's like, there's some things that, you know, kind of cringe at. And I almost wanted to send you back. Like, I don't know if, you want, but it's like, no, that is who I am. And that's what I did. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's like, just because I did those things doesn't mean that's who I am today, but it made me who I am today. Right. And so it's like, I don't run from them. I, I, I willingly accept them. Um, the thing is that that man that did those things no longer exists. Yeah. And that's how I, I, I recently had a conversation with somebody and shared some of my, my past stuff. And they were like, wow, it's very interesting. Would never expected it. And there was a, so a comment um, he made that like did trigger me a little bit. I was like, oh, that was a little too close to home. And I'm like, oh, well, that just means that's a piece that I'm still attached to. Mm. Because like you said, there's other things I've done that I can be like, I don't even know who that was. That feels like a whole nother lifetime. It doesn't, and it, by being transparent and open and sharing that, that's how I was able to detach from it. Yeah. And it's, it's when we put it in the shame box and hide it, that um, it has power. And that's, that's, it has power, but we have to go, like, we have to go, I call it the dungeon, mm. right? We have to go in the dungeon and we have to, we have to face those fears head on right? And we have to go through them, right? We can't hide fear. We can't run away from fear. The only way to deal with fear is going through it. And it's a fear is such a, it's one of the most powerful emotions that can be created internally. It's destructive. It causes all kinds of illness and disease. And we're seeing it firsthand with what's going on in our, in our, in our country, in our world today, it's being run by fear. And, um, It's like, we all have our own demons. And until you go down in the dungeon and deal with those demons and and what comes out of that is power. Like you go down and you go through that, you walk through that stuff. It gives you power. Um, Yeah, right. Yeah, it's like Popeye (laughs) and a spinach, you know? You go through the dungeon and you have to go through that darkness. Um, And when you do one, the next one gets easier yeah it's because momentum. your brain's like oh okay i because can do this on the other side of that is so much light that we're holding away from us as long as we hold these down in this, that that dark box we don't get to that light and there's tons of it there it's it's, it's just pure power mm-hmm. it's um but it you know that's where real courage right and, and and i was saying that all all men of faith have courage Right. And so I'm a man of faith and that's where my courage comes from, because I have to believe in something that's bigger than me. I call it my creator, God, whatever. It put me here Um, and I have to have faith that it put me here for a reason. Right. And that reason is my purpose to be a maximum service to God and to others. And so it's like I have that faith and it's like when I get caught up in the minutia of life. Um, I just have to zoom out. I have to be where my hands and feet are. I have to be present. And I can't, and and to go back to what I was talking about is that fear, the fear is um, it's fake. It's uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the acronym false uh, evidence. Yes. Appearing real. real. Yes, exactly. Cause that's what it is. And it's, it's once you go through it, it's never as bad as we make it up in our mind. It's never as bad as we make it up in our mind. And, um, and because look, I think there's two types of fear, right? Um, there's real fear. And what I mean by that real fear, life threatening fear, um, somebody holding you up with a gun, that's real fear. Right. And then there's fear of what's this person going to think of me if I do this, right? That's not real fear. That's fake fear. 
um, being on an airplane hurling towards the ground that's about to crash. That's real fear, right? Um, fear of, um, you know, what is somebody going to like what I, what I just did at work um, or whatever it is. It's, it's, that's the false evidence appearing real. And it's like, once we, once we just have to sift through it and we sit with it and we realize what it really is. And that's why um, for me, meditation um, is such a, just a giant practice that I, I've been doing it every day for so long that I can't even really remember what my life was like before it. And that's where I believe you have to get where I, it's just, it's just something I do. It's like, it's like breathing is like eating. It's it, in your unconscious mind. It's just it's something it. I do. It's yeah. I wake up, I make my coffee and I go meditate. And it's like, that's the, that's the systems. Mm -hmm. That's what we have to, and, and it for, for everybody has to come up with their own. You know, I'm just saying that's a, such a powerful healing practice that, um, you can't do it wrong. There's no wrong way to meditate. Like there's so many different ways, whether the guided meditation, whether it's sitting quietly for two minutes, there's walking meditations. There's just so many breathing. Yes. Like breath work is huge. I do daily breath work. You know, I'm a big believer in the Wim Hof method. Um, but it's just, these are, they're just little biohacks that, that are out there. And it's like, look, I wouldn't do any of this stuff if it didn't make me feel better. So I preach this to anybody. Um, if you're doing a practice and it doesn't make you feel better, quit it. Yeah. Stop. Stop doing it. Yeah. Don't compare just because it worked for you. Right. Like, oh, well, something's wrong with me. Right. It doesn't, yeah. Do it because it makes you feel better. Yeah. Do it because it makes you feel good. And then when you find those things that make you feel good, start collecting them. Start, you know, start tweaking them so they don't get boring, finding new ways to do different things, but find what makes you feel good. And, you know, that's the, you hear a lot of people talk about find your why, mm -hmm. right? And my why is to feel good. And, um, you know, that's, uh, yeah, but um, yeah. Well, I and mean, then going back to the fear thing, I think it is important to sit when fear comes up mm -hmm. because we're, when it comes up, be like, okay, is this real? Or is this imaginary? And I, I had that happen recently. And I was like, oh my God, I had a person, a dream. And then the person showed up in my office and I was like, okay. Mm. <laughs> and it, it, it created fear at first. And so I had to sit with that and process, okay, is, what's the fear in this? And, and, and as I, and I had to sit with it and take space to sit with it and see what that meant for me, because we have traumas, we mm. have PTSD, we have things that have happened in our life. And we develop fear because we, our brain wants us to avoid that, that was that created fear in the past. And then there is, like you said, times like somebody comes in and you're like, no, be fearful, like stay away from this person. Yeah. You know, type thing. yeah so, so it is, I've started that practice of like, okay, let me sit with this. Is this really fair? Is this my intuition saying no, or is this um, my wounding mm. trying to tell me a lie? And so I love that you, yeah. you, mention that and so uh i want to say it was um september of 2018 so i do um i do hospice work i sit with uh, pan uh you know patients with terminal illness um and um uh, i went to a uh a, a retreat in uh san rafael california with a man who i uh i deeply love he wrote a book called five invitations his name's frank ostaseski he uh, he founded the Buddhist Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco, um, which is the first Buddhist hospice in the United States. Um, he runs an institute called the Metta Institute out there in um, Northern California. Um, and the book Five in Invitations, and he sat with, he has now sat with tens, and he, he's one of the foremost authorities on death. Um, and I, I just, I, I really admire the man. If you get a chance to read the book, I highly recommend it um, because, you know, there's two certainties in this world. Um, one that we're born and two that we die, you know, the leading cause of death is birth. Um, but when he talks about fear, um, and I don't know if this was a story he told at the retreat or if it's in his book, but um, he was talking with a, uh, a guy who lays lines up in the, uh, Montana and what I mean by like telephone poles mm -hmm. right and he was training um, a fellow 
worker um, and what they teach you when you're laying a line and the crane's putting the line in and it's set and the crane pulls away. Well, sometimes they don't, they don't hold. And we're talking about giant, giant telephone and power lines. Sometimes they don't hold and they fall. Um, and your natural reaction when you see a giant pole falling towards you is to run away from it, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not what they train you to do. You run away from it, there's a good chance that's going to smash you because you have no idea where that's going. As soon as you turn your back and you run, you have no idea where that pole is going. So what they train you to do is you turn right towards that pole that's falling mm -hmm. and you run right at the base of that pole. You run right at the base of it because as you get closer to the pole, as it's slowly falling, you can see where it's going to land and you can't avoid that pole. And so he compares that to the fear. Mm -hmm. The fear is that pole falling. And the only way to survive that fear is to run right towards it because you're going to see where it lands and you can see what to do and you can see how to maneuver and you can see how to, to go through it. And then that pole lands and it doesn't smash you and kill you. Mm -hmm. Feel that in my heart chakra <laughs> as you're talking it was like doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah i love that it's uh he's an amazing man so if you get a chance to check out he is just uh one of my heroes and uh you know i spent some time with him uh before that at, um over in hawaii at, at uh one of ron Doss's last uh retreats on maui he was one of the keynote speakers and that's when i was just i just you know two months prior to that started working with the hospice patients. And it's like, you know, those are God things, right. You know, and then he's there and he's, you know, who he is. And it's like, you know, those things, I, I take the word coincidence. It no longer exists in my vocabulary because those kind of things, you know, when I say it, the people that know me, like they, they kind of smirk at me when I like, Oh, what a coincidence, you know, because <laughs> they know that there's no such thing, not in my life, not mm -hmm. today, not today. So. Yeah, love that. So with your, for just everybody, if like what with your, I love that you have the mission, that your mission statement that you say every day, because then you can make decisions, does this support my mission statement or does this not? Um, and so volunteering at the hospice, that's obviously something that supports your mission, yeah, your absolutely. mission statement. How else do you support others or if, um, People wanted to reach out to you, obviously, when the book comes out, uh, get the book. Um, but no, I mean, I make myself available, um, you know, uh, because that's what was done for me. So, you know, if anybody is dealing with family members that are um, dealing with any type of alcoholism, addiction issues, even even, um, you know, depression, overweight, any like I've run the gamut, like I truly believe. Right. God has put me through these things so I can go out and help others, right? There is a purpose for every trauma, every destructive activity that I've done to myself or that, you know, has been an occurrence in my life. That all has purpose to me. And so I make myself fully available. And I, and, you know, um, you can reach out to me on, on Instagram. It's at Jake Goody on Twitter at Jake Goody, you know, personal email, Jake Goody at gmail.com. I don't have, I have no issues with anybody ever reaching out to me. And if there's something I can do, then, you know, I do tell people, you know, I don't go chasing victims. That's one thing I don't do. Right. Um, because there has to be a level of accountability. Like, so someone, you know, I have, a, you know, I'm an example of a sober man. And so there's a lot of people that see that and they're, they're amazed and it, it, it rings true and it gives them hope when they have a family member that's struggling with it. And they're like, Hey, will you call my brother? And I'll say, no, no, absolutely. I, I can't do that. And that's what I mean by chasing victims. But what I will do is, is I'll say, here's my cell phone number. Please tell them to call me. Please tell them to call me. Um, and, 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 and at that point in time, you know, I have a, a level of identification where, I can relate to the, the, these people that are struggling with these different um, illnesses. That's what they are. They're illnesses um, because it's a common peril, right? They talk about like, you know, um, people who survive a sinking ship, right? They get on the lifeboat and there's a sense of, we survived it. There's a sense of camaraderie 
um, that exists because the common peril is the boat was going down and we were going to sink with it. We got in the lifeboat and we escaped. And so they're automatically connected by that common peril. And life is that boat going down. Mm -hmm. And I know what it's like to be on that, that boat going down. And I'm here with the life raft and I can identify with your peril. Um, and so it's like, you know, I, I make myself fully available to help that way. Um, but it gets it simplified down to, um, you know, I try to just do one nice thing for somebody in my day. That's how it starts, right? Whether that being holding the door open at quick trip for an old lady walking in with that's halfway in the parking lot. And I'll just stand there until she gets all the way to the door and she'll be like, wow, thanks for holding the door. It's like, then I can check that off my list. It's like, I just did something. It, it can start as that simple. And just holding the door for somebody. You know, because very rarely do I have that person not smile at me. Mm -hmm. So you just created a smile, like mm -hmm. awesome. Like they just smiled at you. You can smile back and it's like, you have no idea what kind of effect that can be on some, what's going on in their day. And that maybe that's what they needed. You know, well, and I think it's twofold because I had that happen one time I was walking to the post office and this young boy runs up, runs ahead and opens the door for me. And I was like, OK, I was like, your mama did good. You know, I was like really excited. Um, it, it does make a difference. I also think when we're struggling and we're suffering and we're, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not at shame, guilt, spirals, whatever. If we can do one little thing good for somebody else oh yeah that's, it helps us and it's because you're doing it you're not doing it from a place of oh let me do this and what you're going to give me it's more of let me just do this to be of service and a little thing like holding the door or helping somebody pick up something or whatever absolutely is, it's like it's huge for your own well-being it is but it's like what's the quickest way to get out of our own mind is to help somebody else be of service mm -hmm. because you're you're getting out of your mind Mm -hmm. right and it makes you feel good like let's be honest like I wouldn't have that purpose if it didn't make me feel good yeah right if it didn't make me feel good to go help others I wouldn't do it and like you know some people say to me and look it, I do believe um you know both my parents passed of cancer I, and they both had um they both were in the hospital for a long period of time before they passed with it and so I do have an innate ability to sit with somebody in that situation and it's not easy and not everybody has it but i would be lying to you if i said it. like it, it's not pure altruism alt it's not altruistic it's not pure altruism it, because i get something out of it mm -hmm. right i get life experiences like i'll share a story um this gentleman i sat with um i'll leave his name out for hipaa reasons <laughs> but um, he was, uh, he was a colonel in the army and, um, is one of my first patients. And I sat with him probably, you know, like four months before he passed, he had, um, he had a slow cancer. Um, and so I go sit with him, you know, three or four times a month. Um, and we developed a friendship and, and, um, you know, we talk about, you know, um, I don't hide like there's a distinct difference for me between spirituality and religious. And he was a, a very devout Christian. Um, and I grew up in the Catholic church and um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big God guy, but like religion has its place. Um, but I'm, I would consider I'm a spiritual being. Um, and so we would have these beautiful conversations and um, we were talking one day um, and you know, he started getting choked up um, and we were just talking about, you know, the reality of, you know, life after death or what my viewpoint and his viewpoint and what's next. And he broke down and started crying mm -hmm. uh, and he was trying to hold it back so hard. And, and I was like, let it out. And he did. And he said, that's the first time I've ever cried in front of another man. I'm sorry. He apologized to me for it. He's like, I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, dude, no, don't apologize. Like, look, you're dying and you just did something you've never done before in your entire life. 
and you didn't have to leave the hospital bed. It's like, what else can we find? It's like, what else can we find that you haven't done with your life in your life that you, we can do like, you know, let's start finding stuff that you've never done before. You know, it's like, but it's like, like he did something he'd never done before. And it's like, because of a structure set up in, inside of him to make him think that this is not okay. It's not okay to cry in front of another man, but he did it and felt a relief and then was, you know, but it's like, I had that moment, right? And that moment was a beautiful moment that I'll keep forever, you know, for the rest of my life. And it's like, that's why I do those things. That's, you know, and it's like, that's a little selfish for me, but I'm okay with that because it's like, I, I, I can look past people's illnesses, you know, it, it's taken, you know, work and, study and you know reading about and going to retreats and and learning about um you know the dying process um where i can walk into a room and i'll look at that sick person and i won't see any sickness whatsoever i'll look right through it and all i'll see is a soul and i'll make myself available and some people want to sit in their sickness and and i let them and that's okay and some people haven't been looked at like that since they've been in the hospital or in life yeah. a lot of people are never seen right right but it's like are. it's like i'll see their family members walk in and they'll be like oh it's okay dad you're gonna get through this and then they'll walk out the room and you know we hear oh, he's not gonna make it you know and he and they'll look at me and be like like you don't look at me like that why is it why is everybody lying to me why i know i'm dying why don't they realize i'm dying you know, and it's like, I provide that space where it's like, you know, it's like lung cancer, man, that sucks. Like, that's an inevitable reality. And it's like, I, I don't, but I don't look at them as person with lung cancer. I just look at them as a soul sitting there with another soul. And that's it. You know, and it's just like, um, I think that honors the experience. 100%. It, it honors what they're going through. Yeah, absolutely. And some people, you know, some people don't want the truth and some people are, are dying for it. Literally. How do you, de- how do you determine? Cause I've been told sometimes I'm brutally honest. So I've worked on getting the brut- brutally out of there, but I am want to live a very honest, authentic life. So how do you determine mm-hmm. if somebody I mean, wants to hear it or not? That's um, in that situation, I let them dictate the tempo. Gotcha. Right. And it, it usually takes weeks of just getting to know somebody. And sometimes you don't have weeks. And sometimes it's, it, you know, I visit with somebody for two, two visits and then they pass. Um, but to go back to something that you're, it's like, it's such a fine line to balance, right? Being compassionate and being honest, right? Um, and, and especially with the ones that we love, um, because we are ultimately, we care about them and that's why we're being honest. But if, if we're being harmful with our honesty, it's um, that we need to find a better way to be honest or, and what's that mean? It means maybe ask them if they want our opinion mm-hmm. instead of just giving it to them. Like, Hey, do you want to know what I think about that? Or, you know, but it, it is um, because well, you- I also like what you said earlier of uh, when you have a loved one that you feel is suffering, maybe you have an illness, maybe you have a problem. Because I'm saying, saying you're an alcoholic or you've got the stuff, which is going to trigger a whole resistance thing, but you're still giving a choice right? if somebody asks for that. So I just, that, that was pivotal to me when you said that. So I just like giving them a choice. Maybe you're this or maybe that, maybe you can find it. Exactly. And I think that the, the best way to connect, like, look, we're never going to convince anybody of what we think. That's just not, that's just not a reality. It's not a reality that I live in. If you watch Facebook, (laughs) I see people doing it all the time. That's why I'm not on Facebook. But but meaning that like, if you let people come to their own conclusions and how do we do that is we ask questions and we listen, we listen. And what I'm working on today is that I genuinely listen to that person. I don't sit there and think about what I'm going to say next. I listen to what they're saying to me and then I sit with it and it's like, listen twice, talk once. And it's like, um, if, 
you're intentional with your words and you ask, there's always a right question to ask. And if we're asking the right questions, we can help people get to their own conclusion, right? And so as, you know, maybe is it simple as, hey, do you think you have a problem with alcohol? And maybe their answer is like, hell no. And it's like, okay, just wonder, you know? And then, but it's like, if we ask the right questions, like what, what do you think about this? Or what do you think uh, somebody who has a drinking problem looks like then? Or, you know, just let people come to their own conclusions. And look, the reality is some people don't want help, right? And so it's like, we got to be careful in who we try to help. And we also got to be careful on the people who ask us for help, right? Um, you got to be very discerning. But it ultimately goes back to being within the structure of your authentic self, right? What can you live with? Right. And what does it feel good or does it feel like obligation? Right. Like with like, like who we help. If you're helping somebody out of obligation versus something that feels good. 100 percent 100 percent Big difference in the purpose outcome. behind it. What's yeah. the purpose behind it? What's the why? And and it's like um if 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 we're if we're trying to help somebody because you know we want them to be better. Well, it doesn't matter what we want. They have to want to be better. And if they don't want to be better, then we're wasting energy, precious energy that we should be devoting elsewhere. And that's the reality. I look at my energy meter as every 24 hours, I'm giving a set amount of energy. And I have to be super cautious of how I spend it, where I spend it and who I spend it with. Because look, the reality is, there are energy suckers out there. There are people that will latch on you and strain your energy. And that's a reality. Like, um, it, it's like those people that are like the, the, why is this happening to me people? Right. And it's like, it's not, it's not happening to you. You're doing it to yourself in one way or another. Right. And it's like, I can't have those people in my life. Not for very long. Right. It's just because it, it just sucks my energy out and then it makes me irritable. And then my energy meter for the day where I should be spending it helping others is being sucked out on these, these people who just, they just want your pity. And it's like, look, there's a difference between being compassionate and, 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 and letting people take advantage of us. Right? There's a real difference. And that's where you mentioned earlier, boundaries are so vital. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, we have to, respect ourselves before anybody else because if we don't respect ourselves we can't respect others yeah so i can't have respect for you until i first respect myself and if i'm um and, and i have you know the guidance system right and it's like if i feel good i know i'm doing the right thing if i feel bad i know something is off and so I need, there needs to be a tweak somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's in me, whether it's in my environment, whether it's in my actions, whether it's in my thoughts, somewhere there needs to be a tweak. And so it's like, um, back to where, where you're going with is, um, how do we discern between being compassionate and then just being brutally honest? It's like, that's where your guidance system comes in. It's you have to read every situation. You have to use your best level of discernment. And the truth is that sometimes we make mistakes. And I'm going to go fully back to where you asked me about my 30 days on the mountain. And um, if, and I have been at, like, so my therapist asked me, it's like, what's your biggest takeaway from being up on that mountain? What's your biggest takeaway? And I said, without a doubt, my biggest takeaway are in my life, mistakes are absolutely necessary. They're necessary. They're vital to me and my growth right? Because when you make a mistake, there's a level of suffering that goes on. You suffer. But what I found is I don't grow without suffering, right? I have to have some kind of friction to cause a growth. And so those mistakes, right? They have to happen. And so sometimes when we're trying to help the ones we love, when we're trying to help them help themselves, we're going to make mistakes. And it's like, those have to happen. But that just means that okay, I just, I just was not very compassionate with that person. I was brutally honest to a fault. 
and I hurt them, mm. right? I have to go clean that up for me, right? I have to go say, hey, look, what I said was wrong. I still believe this, but the way I said it was wrong and I shouldn't have come at you with this. Is there anything I can do to make that up, make it right? And I have to amend that situation. And I've had to do that with my kids. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean it, <laughs> but they don't listen. And it just like, <laughs> like, and it sets us back a, a half hour because we did it just took that. But as a mom owning, okay, yes, you still need to follow these rules, but maybe I could have stayed a little right. calmer. Right. But it, it goes back to look, we're human beings and we're going to make mistakes and they're inevitable, but where they can be fixed. And what I mean by that is, I don't want to make the same mistake twice. Will I? Probably. But I want them to happen. The frequency needs to expand where I'm making less mistakes. If I'm continuously hurting people by being brutally honest, I need to assess what I'm doing. Yeah. Right. I need to assess what I look at as being truthful because look, truth changes. That's my experience. Truth changes. My truth has changed throughout my life. Yeah. But what doesn't change are facts. Facts don't change. Truth changes, but what are the facts? What I think if we get so righteous in our truth mm-hmm. that our, our righteousness, we are going to hold on to that truth, even if things have changed. 100%. Because I know my beliefs and what God looks like has changed and it will continue to change as I to. evolve. Right. But if I was still so rigid and holding on to that truth, then uh, are righteous about it, then that's when you miss opportunities right. and to then, grow. But also for me, that doesn't, like if I'm holding on to that righteousness for too long, I'm going to feel, I'm going to feel it like in how I feel. And like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to feel for very good. Like Walker, I might for maybe that moment. Yeah. For that moment, <laughs> I might feel righteous, but when I sit with it and I yeah. do my daily re- review and I look back at my day and I assess, you know, how did I feel throughout my day? Where, what points? And I do that. You got my daily review. It's like, where did I feel good? I want to add more of that to my day tomorrow. Where did I feel bad? Where did I not like the way I felt today? And then I look at it and I say, was somebody else involved? And if the answer to that, yes. Do I need to fix it? Do I need to amend it? Did I hurt somebody? And do they, you know, and I don't, I don't say apology because for so long in my life, I would just apologize to people. I can't tell you at the end of my drinking, how many people were so sick and tired of hearing Jake say, I'm sorry, Mm. I'm sorry. No, today I don't say I'm sorry. I say I was wrong. There's Mm. a big difference between saying I'm sorry. And look, I was wrong. How can I fix this? Mm. You know, and and most of the times just saying that it's all people want. That's all they want. Mm -hmm. Right. And some people are like, you know what? you're wrong. You know, can you go do this for me? Whether, you know, or can you help me with this? I'm struggling with this. They open up, right. Instead of closing off, you know, cause we have a disagreement, they close off and then they, they're allowed to, you provide space for them to, Oh, he said he was wrong. Well, I was wrong too. You know? And it's like, it, sometimes it's all it takes and, yeah. and, and it fixes it. And sorry, just for me, sorry doesn't fix it it might be i'm sorry and i was wrong yeah yeah because i've gotten those apologies before uh, i'm sorry but you did this right. the, the buts right it's the sorry but it's i'm like, sorry but you should have done something different right no if it's if it's sorry it. but it's not really sorry yeah no i love it just owning it that's wrong yeah yeah it's like i have to review my days so i can you know because i can't live with those those things in my life because what they do is they build up and they turn into resentments and like if I have a resentment it's not hurting the person I resent mm-hmm. it's only hurting me yeah it's only hurting me it's we just, get, and it keeps us stuck in the past yeah and I can't live with negative emotions in me I just can't because one and, and that's like like that's the blessing that alcoholism is for me today because if I live with too much uh emotional agony in my life I'm going to be so discontented and so uncomfortable that my mind will want to go back to the only solution on planet earth that it knows, mm-hmm. right? Because if, if I'm living in those negative emotions, if I'm living in resentment, fear, anger, well, you can't live in those and live in the positive emotions that you find God in. So I'm living in those negativity emotions. I don't have God present in my life. 
And that's when you know you're disconnected, right? Absolutely. And it's like, I have little triggers that I pay attention to uh, in my days, like, like dri- driving over here, right? I'm on 635 and somebody waits all the way to the very end and they slide right in front of me right before the, the, the embarkment, the embridgement and cut me off. And it's like, if my reaction to that is to give them the middle finger and get really road ragey, then I know it's not that person that cut me off's problem. Like, that's my reaction. If it's like, yeah, go ahead, whatever. I know I'm cool. I know I'm good with God. How did you handle it today? I was good. All right. I was good. I was good. <laughs> I mean, I mean, initial is like, what are you doing? And then it's like, okay, well, whatever. Like, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. That was when I started my work. Um, that was one of the things I noticed road rage change. Like sometimes it, sometimes our growth and change and being more connected and using our tools to process life, it's hard to measure sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And I realized like what the first time that somebody like did something in, the, in a car, you know, and I was like, oh, all right. I was yeah. like, oh, what? you know, that was like, like a concrete change and shift in my perspective. Um, and so I, I, I get that one too. When I start to get a little road ragey, that's a sign that yeah. I'm probably running on E. <laughs> right, right. And it's like, <laughs> to me, like my biggest challenge is like, just keep a mouth shut. Yeah. Like just keep my mouth shut because, you know, even. Well, and I, I love that you don't keep your mouth shut anymore. You just connect it and come from a different place. True, true. But yeah. it's, it, it, that's, a, <laughs> that's a great point. Yes. But it's like biting my tongue when I know that I'm, it's, it's, it's not going to benefit me or the person that's speaking because I'm not going to change their mind. So for me to just say, you know what, I don't think I fully agree with that, but that's okay. Yeah. You know, I don't, you know, and if, and if they're like, well, why don't you agree with me? It's like, you know, um, there's lots of reasons, but we don't need to get into it. Yeah. Like that, that for me is a practice today. Yeah. It's like, because before the person that lets us decide who to spend our energy on exactly because it's exactly. not worth having an argument over because something that's not before i was constructive before i was this version of me it was like i i'm a loud person and i'm louder than most people and it's like i will win this argument because <laughs> i am louder than you and if i talk so loud that it turns you off and you leave the room well i won <laughs> i won i win and it's like today it's more important for me to be free than right. Mm. It's more important for me to have that, that sense of personal freedom and let that person be right and not me insert my will and insert my viewpoint and insert my opinion and tell them why I'm right. It's to be have that f- sense of freedom where I don't, I don't need to. I just don't because I know who I am, why I am, what I'm about, and that's enough. Awesome. Right. Yeah, love that. So as we end up, if you were going to give your top two, three date practices or the top three um, things that you um, are non-negotiable for you, what would those things be? Um, I mean, for me, it's, um, man, <laughs> I, I've, I've built a lot. So you're making me have, have to try it. Um, Some of them I have to tie into one, sure. multiple things into one box. Well, let me first say this, that a lot of people have asked me what's this book about right and i kind of went into a little bit it's about people being their own hero people uh helping themselves but ultimately when somebody asked me that question what's this what's your book about right Mm -hmm. and it's like what my book is about is about finding my innermost being through living a principled life right and so i kept this out like so these are the 12 principles I live with today. Is this in your book too? This is in my book. All right. Um, honesty, hope, faith, courage, integrity, willingness, humility, brotherly and sisterly love, justice, perseverance, spiritual awareness, and service. Awesome. All right. So those are the, like, so. So is I, that how you compare? That's like your guidepost for absolutely. everything in life? It's like what, like when, when I, when my, are one or more of these principles behind my actions, mm-hmm. right? And if so, the answer is yes, and I'm living a principled life in that action. Um, but I just wanted to get that out there um, because I yeah. get that, I get that question asked a lot, what's your book about? And that's what my book's about, finding your innermost self through living a principled life. And then go back to your, your question was, what are some practices? 
my practices, I mentioned meditation and I, and I lumped them all, these three things all in one. So um, every day, the first thing I do um, after getting my coffee and using the restroom um, is I sit down in the same place in my house, same room, same spot every day. And I've lived in that house since July of 19. And it's, that's where I go every morning before I um, look at my phone, before I have a conversation, um, you know, I get up super early. So there's, I get up, my, my character is built in the darkness, right? Mm-hmm. In the, in the silence and the darkness of, of the early morning. That's, that's where, that's where I find my strength. And so I lump these three things into one. I have a, a set prayers that I say and read. I have intentions that I set for the day. And then I sit quietly. Um, and it's become quiet. And when I first started doing this, um, was back in 2016. And I used to listen to meditation music, which is hi- I highly recommend it. for me to get where I am today. I had to have that mm-hmm. today. It's sitting in silence, right? Because that's how my practice has developed. So sit quietly, whether that's with music in your ears or a guided meditation, some form of meditation that's still, right? So prayers, set intentions, and and still meditation. Though that's that would be my first one. Though that's the first thing. Um, the second one would be some type of physical activity, whether that be walking for ten minutes, thirty minutes, a couple miles, whether it be heavy weightlifting, whether it be do something to get your heart going and get your uh, the look. Our brains are chemical factories, right? Uh, and that's just the truth. Like. We are inundated in a system that's run by, and I'm, we're not going to get political, and I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but you look around, big farm controls a lot of what's going on in this world. And there's facts and statistics to prove that. I'm not going to have a discussion about it, but look, those are chemicals too. And our brains create all those. They create them all, right? We don't need a pill to create those those chemicals in our brain. Some people are sick and they need them. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm not anti-drugs because I think they serve a place in a time and, and people do need them and they do help. But my point being is that physical activities get the, you know, get your heart rate going and get your, you know, get the neurons firing. So some type of physical activity, that would be my second one. Um, and then, um, you know, finding out, um, something bigger than you and getting connected with that every day. I call that God, but the beauty that I find in God is that whoever's watching this, you sitting here next to me, nobody knows what I mean. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows what, when I say the word God, there's not another spirit in this universe that knows what my God is to me. So my, my, my big thing would be, and you don't, you know, you don't use the word God, you can, you know, you, whatever it is that you like, that is bigger than you, right? Because we are not the biggest thing in this universe. And if you think you're the biggest thing in this universe, okay, (laughs) but you're not, um, but find what that is to you. You know, I know a guy who his quote unquote, God is getting on his Harley and, uh, on a sunny day, riding all day long. Right. That's how he gets in touch with he he feels a sense of something greater than him when he's doing that. Right. Whatever that is, like find what that is to you and do it. Get connected. Right. If it's sitting in nature, if nature is your God, go hug a tree. I'm all about it. I'm all about it. You know, Um, you know, but but find. Like I said, lack of better word, find what your God is and get connected to it. Mm -hmm. And then surrender to it and say, you know, you're bigger than me and I'm here and it's, I, you know, and you're there. Yeah. I love that. Of, and I say that a lot when I work with clients of um, finding your connection um, because a lot of times, and I even went through this when I went from growing up super religious and then sort mm-hmm. of my awakening, then I got bitter and I, you know, and, and so everything had to change, but finding what that your connection is so that you have something to believe in or if you're asking for help or or whatever in life to know to know there is something bigger yeah and for me for me what mine is is like you know so 
I don't have to go anywhere to get connected to God because everywhere I go, I have a soul, I have a spirit, and I call that my God spark, mm-hmm. right? When God put me here, it's just a little itty bitty spark of what he is, she is, it is, right? Um, and I'm a spark of that. And so I can automatically get, anytime I can get in tune with my innermost being, with my soul, with my Atman, whatever you want to call that, I call it my God spark. Anytime I want to get connected, I can, no matter where I am, no matter what's happening to me, I can get connected with it. And that's mine. And that gives you freedom. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for providing the space. I'm glad uh, we manifested it. We did it. We did it. High five. (laughs) Thank you for being honest and vulnerable and um, sharing. And um, I'm excited for the people that will be impacted and and helped by that. Yeah, I hope uh, hope it did some good. And like like I said, if you you need to get connected to me, um, reach out to Audrey, get connected to me on social media or my email that I mentioned earlier. Um, and, and I can put it in the notes awesome. for the recording. So, too, yeah. so don't hesitate. If you're, if you're hurting, like you don't, you, you don't have to struggle anymore and you're not alone. That's the biggest message. You're not alone. Yeah. We're, we're all in this together. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. All right. <laughs> Bye-bye. Not to stop. <laughs>